morning, ladies and gentlemen. We want to wonderfully welcome to welcome you to another week where we are going to have a wonderful time with the tutor on my TV tutor on Ocean One TV. Now, as usual, I'm going to promise you a wonderful lesson, a lesson where you are going to have the opportunity to phone in to ask your question or make any suggestion. And me, the teacher, would also have the wonderful opportunity to attend to your questions right away. Now, as usual, at the beginning of the week, we are going to take you through biology. And I am Smith Arthur. I will be your tutor for the lesson. Now, over the couple of the past few weeks, we are looking at uh, cell division and cell cycle. So, first of all, took the cell cycle and looked at what goes on in the cell cycle. We finished that and we took cell division. And we also looked at what actually happens in cell division. Now realize that cell division involves or it's, it comprises of two major processes. That is chiokinesis and cytokinesis. We took our time to know what chiokinesis means and what cytokinesis means. Then from there we went on to look at the two major cell, uh, cell divisions we could have in higher organisms or smaller organisms. So we considered the mitosis and meiosis. Now last week, God willing, we looked at mitosis. We took the time and went through what mitosis is. We realized that mitosis is an equational division and we talked about mitosis a little bit into details. We realized that mitosis can also be grouped into two as chiokinesis and cytokinesis. They realized that the chiokinesis is made up of four different stages, what we usually call the, the PMAT. So we came across the prophase, we came across the metaphase, we came across the anaphase, and we came across the telophase. So we went on to look at what really happens at each of these stages. Then from there we considered the cytokinesis. Um, today, we are, time has permitted us to continue that lesson by looking at meiosis. So we want to look at meiosis, we want to look at which organism that's uh, which organism or which cells does meiosis actually occurs? They want to look at what are the types of meiosis? What is meiosis at all? So in general, that is what we want to look at this morning. So the obvious question is, what is meiosis? Now you can see, we say that meiosis is a division that occurs in the organism during the formation of reproductive cells. So you see, we saw that mitosis occurred in somatic cells. Now we are realizing that um, meiosis occurs in reproductive cells. That is to say, when the organism is, um, when the division occurs in the sex organ, or in the, when the organ is undergoing reproductive um, formation, then we say meiosis occurs. All right. Now it involves two successive nuclear divisions from one chromosome replication. So when you look at meiosis in general, we are saying that it involves two successive nuclear divisions. You realize that in mitosis, we came across only one nuclear division. But in mitosis, we are uh, in meiosis, we are coming across two nuclear divisions. We'll come and talk more about that. As a result, the characteristic number of the chromosome is reduced to half. The characteristic number of the chromosome is to reduce to half. That is to say, should we start meiosis with a chromosome number of 2n? So there is the organism. If this organism has to divide, this organism will divide to form a haploid. Right, so you realize that you started with 2n, but each daughter cell has a haploid number. So this is a diploid number. We started, we stated this when we started the cell cycle. This is a diploid number, but at the end of the day, we are getting a haploid number. Now, this haploid number can further divide to form another haploid number. So what we mean is that because there is two successive nuclear division, this will cause the number of the uh, chromosome that we started with to half. So if we started with a diploid, we would result in having what? A haploid. All right. Meiosis is therefore referred to as reduction division. So you can see, 
We started with two N, but we are now having only one N in each of the daughter cells. So the total number of chromosome sex we started with has reduced. Hence, meiosis is referred to as a reduction division. I hope you remember that we said that mitosis is an equational division because we realize that the number of chromosomes we started with in, my, in mitosis remains the same in the subsequent daughter cells. But here is the case in meiosis, the number of daughter cells, the number of um, chromosomes we started with in the parent cell is half in the daughter cells. All right. So we say that the diploid number is designated at 2n, while the haploid number is designated as n. A zygote has 2n chromosome. So if that is the case, then each of the egg or the sperm will have one n. Each of the sperms will have what? One n. Therefore, there is reduction of chromosome number during formation of gametes. So this is what we have shown during the formation of gametes. Now, the issue is that we know that individuals, especially higher organisms, exist as a type one. But here is the case in the egg and in the sperm cell, or in the gamete cells, we have only haploid. So what then happened? Don't forget a process called fertilization, which will then bring these two haploid, um, these two um, sex gametes together, thereby going back to have our two end. So we have one egg fertilizing what uh, the sperm. So when this combine, we are getting two n combining, then giving us our two n back. All right. So we are seeing the fertilization involves the fusion of two gametes, so that the diploid number is restored. So though we we lose the diploid number during meiosis, when fertilization comes in, the diploid number that was lost is now what restored. All right. The process described making it possible to maintain a constant chromosome number for each species. I hope it's clear. All right. So the process described the reason why we have constant chromosome number also in meiosis. All right. So let's now boss on and look at what meiosis entails. The division of meiosis can be grouped into two. Don't forget, we said we have two nuclear divisions. That is to say, if I should take meiosis, meiosis is completed in two phases. So we have what we call meiosis one, and we have what we call meiosis two. So when we take meiosis, what we are seeing now is that meiosis is completed in two phases. The first phase is meiosis 1, and the second phase is meiosis 2. Don't forget that we have already established that each phase is made up of two. So we have karyokinesis, then we also have cytokinesis. Now, when you come to meiosis 2, 2, we also have karyokinesis and we also have cytokinesis. Now, we know that under the karyokinesis, we are going to have our PMAT, which we have already explained as prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So, because you have one here, this will be prophase one, this will be metaphase one, this will be anaphase one, then this will be telophase one. Then we get our cytokinesis one. Then, from cytokinesis one, we now move to karyokinesis two. And again, you know, once we have mentioned karyokinesis, we still have our PMAT. So I have prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two. Now, the cell that is entering meiosis, don't forget, it has already undergone interface. It has already undergone interface. So the cell that is entering meiosis 1 has already undergone interface. Now, from cytokinesis 1 to karyokinesis 1, 
There is a short resting uh, phase. There's a short resting phase called the interkinesis. Now the interkinesis lacks the S phase. So over here, the interkinesis that will usher cytokinesis one to chiokinesis two lacks the S phase. That is to say, we realize that the S phase is the phase where replication of DNA occurs. Where replication of DNA occurs. But in this situation, the replication of DNA has occurred in the interface. So there is no need for replication again. So we don't need replication again. So the reason why the resting phase leading to the cryokinesis 2 is called the interkinesis is that it is an interface which lacks the S phase. It is an interface which lacks the S phase. So there will be no DNA synthesis because it had already what taking place. Please, is that clear? All right, so let's now move to the board once again. So we say that each of the haploid cells receive only one of each of the homologous chromosomes. So in the nutshell, based on the diagram I did earlier on, you could realize that the first mitotic division is a reductional division. That is to say, please permit me to write here because we are going to use this to explain further. So when we take our diploid cell, we say that this diploid cell divides into what, a haploid cell. So this will be my meiosis 1. This is what happened in the meiosis 1. So during meiosis 1, my diploid cell is divided into this. So you can see that there is a haploid number. So I could see that the first phase of meiosis is called a reductional phase. It's a reductional phase. Now you could see that the meiosis 2, what will happen is that this further divide and give me another haploid number, give me another haploid number. This also further divide, give me a haploid number, give me a haploid number. So this is meiosis 2. Please let's look at this. You realize that the number of chromosome sets here is the same as the number of chromosome sets here. This was a haploid and this is a haploid. So you could say that meiosis 2 is an equational division. Whereas meiosis 1 is a reductional division. But we, when we join all together, we say that meiosis is a reductional division. So that is the slight difference that I want you to get. All right. So we said that the second mitotic division is an equational, is an equational division. And sister chromatin are separated into different nuclei. Therefore, four cells are produced at the end of meiosis. So you see one, two, three, four. At the end of meiosis, and each with a haploid chromosome number. So you can see the half with N, 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 N. And which you say N is the hybrid set of chromosome number. Whereas 2N is the diploid set of chromosome word number. Alright, so now that we understand this uh, introduction, can we now take meiosis 1 into details and just talk about meiosis 1? So let's first talk of meiosis 1. Now, we have already established that meiosis 1 involves chiokinesis and cytokinesis. So, meiosis 1 actually involves four major stages without the cytokinesis. So, when we add a cytokinesis, it becomes five. So, it involves four major stages. That is prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, and telophase 1. So, to understand this in details, we need to start looking at one we need to start looking at the first phases individually. So let's first consider prophase 1. Again, let us be reminded that we are dealing with SHS level. So there are some um, detailed description that you might not be mentioning as we want to stay in the boundaries of the syllables. So please, um, let's put that in mind, then we can now move on. All right, so we said that the prophase 1 is subdivided into five stages. 
You know, most of the um, SHS books doesn't really mention these stages, but I'm just giving this as an additional information to you. So, Professor One is further divided into five stages. That is the leptotin, the zycotin, the packetin, the diplotin, and the dikinensis. So, in actual sense, there is there is a unique characteristics of each of these five stages that would actually define the prophets. That would actually define the prophets one. So we have the liptotin, the zygotin, the packetin, the diplotin, and the dikinesis. You know what we have done? We have taken all this process and we have summarized it. So in, in, in when you move higher to the investors, we are actually going to look at what happened in the liptotin. We are going to look at what happened in the zygotin. We are going to look at what happened in the packeting. We are going to look at what happened in the diplotin. And we are going to look at what happened in the dikinesis. But what we are doing now is that we have summarized all these things or this event that is happening in these five stages as prophets one. So in other books, you come across late early prophets and you come across late prophets. So we have just summarized the activities of these five sub stages into one for us so that we can easily follow what we are doing. All right, with that in mind, then let's look at it. So what happened in Prophet 1? Under meiosis, we see that chromosomes appear as a long, thin thread. So if this is the cell, if this is the cell, what happened is that we know that the nuclear membrane, don't forget what we did in mitosis. We know that the nuclear membrane remains intact. And we have the chromosomes, which in this fact hasn't condensed. So over here, the chromosomes appear as a long thread like this. And this chromosome has bead. So it is a bead there. So you see something like this. All right. So that's why I said chromosome appears as long thin thread with beaded appearances. So that's what we see. Then again, synapses or pairing begin. Now when you talk about synapses, it is the pairing of homologous chromosomes. So when the homologous chromosomes begins to pair, the recess synapses has begun. So let's say if I have this chromosome and I have a chromosome, this chromosome pairing with this chromosome, so this is where we are referring to as the synapses. So we have another chromosome pair with another chromosome, another chromosome pair with another chromosome. So there is the pairing of homologous chromosomes. So when we talk about synapses, synapses is simply the pairing of homologous what? chromosomes. So that's why we are saying that synapses or pairing begin. Then what does that mean? Homologous chromosomes comes to lie side by side. So that means that this chromosome and this chromosome are homologous. This chromosome and this chromosome are what? Homologous. So the pairing of the homologous chromosomes is what we refer to as what? Synapses. All right. A pair of synapses, a pair of synap homologous form a bivalent. So you see, in actual sense, how many chromosomes are you seeing here? Two. So we call this a bivalent. We call this a bivalent or a dyad. So it is called a bivalent or a dyad. You see, so when we bring, so this is a bivalent, this is another bivalent, so it is a bivalent or what? A dyad. And the bivalent is as a result of synapses. So the pairing of homologous chromosomes leads to the formation of what? A dyad. Please, let's put these steps in mind. Right, so the formation of synapses leads to or results in the formation of what a bivalent or a dyad. All right, the two chromatids of each chromosome may be seen where coiling is somewhat loose. Bivalent is now referred to as a tetrad. So now let's look at it. So, in actual sense, this is how I'm seeing the chromosomes, but this is how this is what really happens. So if this is the chromosome, this is the chromosome, we see another one attached to it like this. But we will see this as this. 
And as we begin to lose this, this is what forms the tetrad. So the bivalent now becomes what? So we now see them as what? A tetrad. All right. Now, why, how, why are you referring to them as a tetrad? Because there are four strands of chromatin lying together. So how many strands are we seeing? Four. Right? That is why we refer to them was as a tetrad. So tet for four. All right. Over here, chromosomes does not separate completely because at some point along the length of the bivalent, non-sister chromosome form a crisscross. Now, let's consider this tetrad, and now let's understand something here. Now, when you mention sister chromatin, let me draw them again to explain the sister chromatin and non-sister chromatin. So if I have a chromosome like this, So these are the chromosomes lying together. Okay. The chromosome of so the two arms of one chromosome, this and this, is referred to as a sister chromatin. Then this arm and this arm, so one arm of the next chromosome and one arm of the other chromosome join together. So these two forms the non-sister chromatin. I hope you get it. So the chromosomes are the chromosomes of the same arm or the same arm of the chromosomes is referred to as the sister chromatin. Whereas the this arm, one arm of this and the other arm of the other one that is lying beside it is referred to as the sister chromatin. And crossing over, crossing over occurs in, in non-sister chromatin. That is to say, when we mention crossing over, one arm of this chromosome, one arm of this chromosome will cross it the arm of this chromosome. So crossing over occurs in non-sister chromatin. That is where crossing over occurs. So crossing over occurs in the non-sister chromatin. It doesn't occur in a sister chromatin. So this is a sister chromatin and this is a non-sister chromatin. So crossing over, which will lead to the exchange of genetic materials, will occur in a non-sister chromatin. Okay, so these are visible under the ordinary light microscope and are called the chiasma or the chiasmata. Now, this is how the crossing over occurs. Okay, let me again show it, then I'll show you the chiasmata too. So, now this is the chromosome, right? One is lying here, one is lying here. Then there is another chromosome, one lying here, another lying here. Now let me darken this one for the purpose of the crossing over. So you see, look at what is happening here. You see that one arm of this chromosome has crossed over, so they form an X like this. There is an, a formation of X figure like this. So you see that one arm of this chromosome has crossed over to this. And because of this crossing, there is going to be there is going to be what we call uh, exchange of genetic material. This point of crossing over is what is referred to as the chiasmata or the chiasma. All right, so the chiasmata is formed as a result of crossing over between non-sister chromatid. Between non-sister chromatid. So when two non-sister chromatid cross over, at the point of crossing over, the point is called what? Chiasmata. All right, and this all happens in prophase one. This all happens in prophase one of meiosis one. All right. Then when this happens, finally we see that the nucleolus and the nuclear membrane begins to disappear. We see that the nucleolus and the nuclear membrane begins to disappear. All right. Now, once there is the disappearance of the nuclear membrane, then we have now moved to metaphase one. We have now moved to metaphase one. So I realize that in meiosis one, in prophase one, we are talking about the synapses, we are talking about bivalent, we are talking about crossing over, we are talking about the chiasmata. Right. So put all of them in mind. Now let's move to metaphase one. Now what happened in the metaphase one? At metaphase one, the nuclear membrane has now completely disappear 
So there is no nuclear membrane again. Then chromosomes have reached the maximum stage of contradiction, of contraction, sorry. Then there is the formation of spindle fiber. Then what, you know, remember in mitosis, we talked about one chief thing and the metaphase. At the metaphase, you see that the chromosomes aligned at the equator. So if this is our cell, if this is our cell, you realize that let me show So as a result of the person over, you could see something here. There is an exchange of genetic material. But one of the chief things you should know on the metaphase is that it is the period where the chromosomes line at the equator. So don't forget, if there is an animal cell, this is our centroid, which is going to lead to the formation of aster. And the aster will lead to the formation of spindle fiber. Right. So and the spindle fiber will attach itself to the kinotocol of the centromere of the chromosome. So we establish that under mitosis. So the same thing happens here. After the crossover bars, okay, and there is an exchange of genetic material, these chromosomes with the exchange of the genetic material lies at the equator of the cell. Lies at the equator of the cell. All right, that's why you are saying that chromosomes move to the equator. And this equator is called the metaphase plate, right? It is also called the metaphase plate. Then when that happens, you move on to anaphase. What, is, what happens in anaphase? You know that in anaphase, the, uh, the spindle fiber are going to pull to the opposite poles. So the spindle fiber attached to this moves to the pole. The spindle fiber, uh, fiber attached to this also moves to the pole. So let's see what is really happening there with another schematic diagram so this is the cell this is our centroid which has formed the what the spindle fiber which attached itself to the chromosomes so this is what actually happens So the chromosomes with the exchange fiber are now being pulled to the opposite poles. Now, see what happens. With this one, there were two chromosomes, two different chromosomes that is being pulled. So over here, you are not going to see interzonal fiber. We are not going to see interzonal spindle fiber. Remember when we treated meiosis and the mitosis, we came across that there was one chromosome like this. And this chromosome has um, two arms like that. Then with one centromere, then the spindle fiber begins to pull them. So when it begins to pull them, what happens is that the centromere divides. So there is a division of the centromere. This division of the centromere leads to the formation of interzonal spindle fiber. So this is being pulled up. This is being pulled down. And because there was a division in the spindle fiber, there is this what we call the interzonal spindle fiber. But that is not the case in meiosis. That is not the case in meiosis. So if they ask you which of the phases does do we have the interzonal spindle fiber, it is actually the other phase of mitosis. It is actually the other phase of mitosis. Because in the other phase of uh, meiosis, that does not work. Okay. All right, so we say that the two centromere of the members forming a bivalent are functionally undivided and they move to the sister chromatic to the pole. As a result, only half the number of chromosomes in the original cell arrives at each pole. So each of the chromosomes or chromatid arriving at each pole will only have only a haploid number. We only have a haploid number. Whereas in the case of mitosis, they would have the diploid number or the number of chromosomes 
this which uh, was present in the parental cell. Okay. This is what brings about the reduction in chromosome number. This is what brings about the reduction in chromosome number. All right, at this moment, we would love to open the phone lines so you could call and ask your questions or give your contribution. So the phone numbers will be displayed on your screen right away. Pick them, the phone number and the MTN number. Pick them and you can call right away so that we could continue the discussion. Now, as we are waiting for your phone calls, now let's look at what happens in telophase one. Let's look at what happens in telophase one. So telephase one, it occurs in some instance, but not always. That is to say, telephase one doesn't occur always in all cells. There are, there are times it occurs and there are times it does not. In those organisms where telophase one occurs as a nuclear membrane occurs, a nuclear membrane forms around each of the group of chromosomes. So that means that where it doesn't occur, there wouldn't be formation of nuclear memory. And again, I've also told you that the trick here is that when uh, the uh, um, prophase and telophase are just opposites. So whatever we lost in prophase, we gain it in telophase. Whatever we lost in prophase, it is gained in telophase. So in prophase, we made mention of the loss of nuclear memory. So in telophase, there will be the gaining of nuclear memory. Is that clear? All right. So the chromosomes go through a short interface before entering the second mitotic division. And I told that this short interface is what is called the interkinesis, which is an interface which lacks an S phase. Which is an interface which lacks an S phase. All right. In other organisms, each group of chromosomes goes straight into metaphase 2. As soon as they reach the poles, as soon as they reach the poles, each of them enter into metaphase 2, as soon as they enter, uh, they reach the poles. So now that we have completed, we have completed telophase 1, which actually brings about the cytokinesis, we are now moving on to meiosis 2. So we are now moving on to meiosis 2. Now, so the question is, what is the difference between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2? Since we still also have our PMAT intact, don't forget we have our PMAT still intact. That is the prophase, the metaphase, the anaphase, and the telophase. We still have them intact. So here yeah, we are going to have prophase 2, we are going to have metaphase 2, we are going to have anaphase 2, we are going to have telophase 2. Alright, now, this is similar to the ordinary mitotic division. So you see, so we are not going to stress ourselves to talk so much about the meiosis 2 because the event which is happening in meiosis 2 is the same as those events that happen in mitosis. Now look at this. Don't forget that we said that in meiosis 1, we have our, our diploid number of cells, and this diploid divided into what? A haploid number, like this. Now, so this is meiosis 1. Now, further division of this brings about the meiosis 2. But look at it, we have a haploid number set of chromosomes. We are going to have a haploid set of chromosomes. So, this is virtually an equational division. And once it is an equational division, it will follow the principles and the things of mitosis because we said that mitosis is an equational division. And that is why they are saying that meiosis 2 is similar to the ordinary mitotic division. So if you understood the division of mitosis as we did last week, we just apply that concept in meiosis 2 and you are done. So we said that it, is, it also involves a haploid set of chromosome number. But the difference is that 
There is no DNA synthesis before the division process. That is why I told you that it is an interkinesis which lacks the S phase. Which lacks the S phase. Alright, so with this that we've said, what it means is that if we revise our lesson on mitosis, we are good to go with uh, we are good to go with meiosis two. We are good to go with meiosis two. Hello, good morning. Can you kindly tell us your name and where you are calling us from? Please speak up. Please speak up. We are we, we can't hear you. Please speak up. Hello. All right. Please call again because we hardly hear you. And please speak up. Thank you. All right. So what I was saying is that with meiosis two, if you revise your notes on mitosis, you are good to go because we have made and we have established the fact that meiosis. Two is similar to the mitotic division. It's similar to the mitotic division. Now, all that I say has been placed on a diagram. All that I said has been placed on a diagram and it has been shown. So, you see that the diagram has been projected. You saw that as I was teaching, I was trying to make the diagrams along for you to understand. But this is the projected diagram. So, at Professor 1, you see that the nuclear membrane begins is intact, though it begins to disappear, but it is intact, right? Then the chromosome condenses, the nuclear envelope breaks down, then crossing over occurs. You have already talked about the crossing over. We've talked about the synapses. You said the synapses will lead to the formation of bivalence. The bivalence will lead to the formation of crossing over, which will lead to the formation of the chi's matter. Okay, this all occur in the prophase one then we now move to the metaphase one so look at the metaphase one you saw that the chromosome hello good morning can you kindly tell us your name and where you are calling us from hello good morning can you kindly tell us your name and where you are calling us from please um can you speak up because i'm really struggling to hear you at the studios Please, dear caller, can you call back? Because I'm really struggling to you. Please call back. Thank you very much. All right, so you can see that in metaphase one, the chromosomes line themselves at the equator. So the chromosomes align themselves at the equator. And the asters that is being formed from the centroid, and that leads to the formation of the spindle fiber, attach itself attach itself to the chromosomes and since after you could see two different sets of chromosomes you can see two different sets of chromosomes hello good morning can you kindly tell us your name and where you are calling us from sorry we've lost your caller please call back because your questions and your contributions are warmly welcomed all right so you realize that there are two separate of chromosomes there Right, but the difference is that there is an exchange of genetic material. There is an exchange of genetic material over here. Right, so the, the, the spider fiber attached to different centromeres, so you are going to pull at different sides. Right, that is the reason I am not going to have the uh, interzonal spindle fiber formation. Okay, so then from there we move on to the other phase one. In the diagram that has been projected on the screen, and you can see the homologous chromosomes moving to the opposite poles of the cells. So the spindle fiber has now pulled through the kinotocon. So, by, so hello, good morning. Can you kindly tell us your name and where you are calling us from? All right, sorry, we've lost another caller. Please keep calling. All right, so that is really happen what happens in the anaphase one. Then from there, we move on to telophase one and cytokinesis. Right. Now, so see what is happening in telophase 1 and cytokinesis. So we said that the chromosome gather at the poles of the cells and the, cytoplas the cytoplasm 
begins to divide, um, divide. Then, as I said, the, we, we know our trick here that our telophase is the opposite of prophase. Whatever was lost in prophase is gained in telophase. So, from then, the cell briefly enters into a resting state where there is no S phase, where there is no DNA synthesis. So they are not going to synthesize the DNA again. So, when that happened, the cell entered into prophase 2, right? Then, under prophase 2, we said that it is similar to the prophase in mitosis. So, what happens? A new spindle fiber forms around the chromosome. Then, when that happens, the cell now enters into the metaphase 2. And the nuclear membrane that reappeared in telophase 1 also begins to disappear. Right, and at telophase 2, what do we see there? The chromosome that might also align themselves at the equator. Right, they align themselves at the equator. Then, what happens is that at the equator, then they move to the other phase 2. In other phase 2, there is the pooling. Right, there is the pooling of the chromosome into the opposite pool. Don't forget that this chromosome that is being pooled has, um, has exchanged. Um, genetic materials, please don't forget that it is very necessary because of the synapses and the charismata formation. Alright, so the centromere divide and chromatid moves to the opposite spools of the cell. So here in anaphase 2, we are going to have the interzonal spindle fiber because it is just like the mitosis. But in anaphase 1, there was nothing like the interzonal spindle fiber. Right. Then from there, the cell enters into telophase 2 and cytokinesis. So, in telophase 2 and cytokinesis, by then it is assumed that the cell has reached the opposite pose. Then the nuclear membrane begins to reform, right? The uh, chromosomes now begins to decondense, right? Then you know that as that happens, the cytoplasm begins to, the cytoplasm begins to divide. So then from there we enter into the cytokinesis and that will lead to the formation of different daughter cells. So at the end of the day, we are forming four daughter cells. At the end of the day, we are forming four daughter cells, right? At the end of the day. And in mitosis, we form two daughter cells. In mitosis, we form two daughter cells. Whereas in meiosis, we formed four daughter cells. Please, is that clear? So you are still listening to your, or you are still waiting for your calls or your questions. Right. Now, with that understood, with this understood, you can now differentiate between meiosis and mitosis in your own way. So a short assignment I want to give you is that as you are in the house, as you are in the house, try and enumerate about seven differences. Try and enumerate about seven differences between mitosis and meiosis. Between mitosis and meiosis. Right. This is all time will permit us for today's lesson. What did we do today? Today we looked at meiosis. We talked about the fact that meiosis occur in the sex chromosome and we also mentioned the fact that meiosis is a reductional division right then from there we went on to look at the fact that meiosis also involves two major processes the chiokinesis and the cytokinesis but we said that meiosis can be completed in two phases as meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 so we took time to look at meiosis 1 which involved our PMATs so we said that we have prophase 1, pro anaphase 1, metaphase 1, telophase 1. Then we have our cytokinesis 1. Then we went on to look at the meiosis 2. We also had our PMAT, but this time around we said that it was prophase 2, it was metaphase 2, anaphase 2, telophase 2. Then we went on to look at um, chiokinesis 2. Then we talk about what really happened in each of these stages. I gave you a short assignment, and the short assignment was to enumerate 
or tabulate seven differences between meiosis and mitosis. I believed you had a wonderful time with me as your tutor. Sorry your course couldn't go through and we hardly heard you on the studio. But I would want to entreat you to stay true to your TV sets as your next lesson will be on your school surely, which is business management. I was your tutor and my name is Smith Arthur. Till we meet again same time next week. It's bye for now. Thank you.